Greetings! <laughs> Greetings, Hi, everyone. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Oh, I'm so excited to be here this evening, aren't you, Dave? Oh, I'm so happy to be here, too. <laughs> yeah. This is great. This is a wonderful evening. <laughs> We're here to celebrate Queer Wise's 10th anniversary. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we're also recognizing World AIDS Day as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. We gotta remember all those people that are no longer with us. Yes, very mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. But we're here to celebrate everything queer. We are Ron DeSantis's worst nightmare. <laughs> and I'm Dave. And I'm Samantha, although all my good friends call me Sam. Sam and I have known each other for years, actually, and we used to be a duo, Dave and Sam. Uh, excuse me, I believe that was Sam and Dave. Um, I had top billing, always. Oh, Sam, I didn't realize you were a top. <laughs> Honey, you don't know the half of it. <laughs> oh, look at all these beautiful people that came out to see us tonight. <gasps> look at that handsome hunk over there. Ooh, wait. Ooh, and that hot little honey there. Ooh, you are adorable. What are you doing after the show, huh? <laughs> Sam, I didn't realize you were bisexual. Oh. I mean, how do you identify? Oh, honey, I'm a bisexual puppet, don't you know? Oh, well, that, that's something I've never tried before. <laughs> I mean, can, can I put my hand inside of you? Hmm, sure, baby. You can put your hand in my hole any day. Oh, wow. Well, you're sure? Oh, uh, yeah. Now that's what we call consent. That's oh. right. That's what we're talking about. But, you know, back to the reason we're here. I mean, these people did not come here to see me fist you. Well, I'll bet Gary Grossman did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is so true. But really, we know that you all came out to see some fantastic writers receive special awards called the Wizards of Words Awards. Oh, I love me some wizards and witches. You know I am one, right? Yeah, I'm a witch. Wow, well, you go, witch. Hey, can you also grant, can you grant wishes? Are you like a wish witch? Well, yeah, of course. Now, you wish for the Democrats to prevail in the Senate, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you're welcome. Yeah. But, you know, didn't I also wish for Trump to be imprisoned? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, well, so just wait. Some wishes take a little bit longer. Yeah, true. But you know what, Sam? I wish that more people were like our radical rabbi, Robin Podolsky, who is being recognized tonight yes. for her commitment to activism, to social justice, and her brilliant prose. Mm -hmm. And how about that cutie pie, Roland Palencia? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not only is he a fab writer, but he's also a producer, an activist, and an organizer. Wow. Hey, Roland, could you organize my bedroom? Uh, yeah. Darling, he's not that kind of organizer. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> oh. And we are also celebrating Terry Wolverton. Yeah. Yeah. Her books are all banned in Florida, but you know. <laughs> Sam, you know her well, right? Oh, well, yeah. She's a writer and a teacher and a right on feminist sister. Woohoo! <laughs> building, right? Yeah. Well, she built it brick by brick alongside her fierce, fabulous feminist friends. <laughs> That's so wonderful. You know, Sam, I'm a feminist too. And you know who else is? Michael Kearns. Yeah. <laughs> who? Who? Oh, Sam, everyone knows who Michael Kearns is. Well, actually, maybe they don't because he, he was banned before banned was a thing. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh wait. I, I remember him. Wasn't he naked on the cover of some book? Oh, yeah. Or maybe naked on stage? Or I don't know, maybe just naked. <laughs> wait, isn't he always naked? <laughs> now, where is he anyway? Is he naked now? Uh, oh, no, he's over there. Oh, I'm sorry. He's wearing clothes tonight, Sam. Oh, no. But he's over there next to Tim Miller. Or is that Sherry Gawkey? I don't know. All these performance artists look the same. They're always naked, all of them. They're like naked, <laughs> naked, naked, you know? <laughs> You say that like it's a bad thing. <laughs> now, wait just a moment. I saw you naked on stage once. Mm, shut up, Sam. Oh, <laughs> you should see that little tushy. Woohoo! Oh, Sam, <laughs> don't say the nicest things to me. Thank you. Okay, but let's get on with our evening, right? Mm -hmm. Introducing, right now, spoken word performances from members of Queerwise. Ooh, I love all those wise careers. <laughs> Thank you. 
Good evening. My name is Lucia, and this piece was written just a couple of months ago for the AIDS 40th anniversary presentation at uh, Lineage Performance Space in Pasadena. Oh, we were becoming so sophisticated. It was 1981, and a gay man from Dallas had come up with the idea and the front money for a national lesbian and gay, that's what we called it then, leadership conference to cut up, come up with a unified, long-range political strategy. Leaders, consequential or not, were plentiful, but any galvanized leadership was pretty much non-existent. One evening after dining with the movers and schmoozers, I ended up sitting in a corner with a group of acquaintances. A prominent activist was warning us about an oncoming crisis. Gay men were dying by the dozens. San Francisco, New York, and soon to be wherever you were. They were dying of a mysterious, complex, hell on earth syndrome, a disease with no name. Our sophisticated long range strategy and many of the people gathered there to design it would soon be turning into dust. Not many months later, an old friend moved back to LA from Chicago. His twin brother, also gay, who had been seriously ill with an unshakable pneumonia, soon joined him. Another friend set him up for a visit to a nutritionist to look into his severe weight loss. I went to pick him up for the appointment. He opened the door and ducked his head down as he turned away, as though ashamed for me to see him. Klaus Kinski and Nosferatu was my first thought. He was the first of the walking skeletons I encountered during those years. The nutritionist diagnosis was celiac. He was wrong. The sick twin got sicker and a team of doctors launched a twin study to see if they could find out more about the disease now being called GRID gay-related immune deficiency. The sick twin died, and the first twin got sick. Then came the nebulous time of swinging between wait, wait, who? and just looking for attention. Mm. On the phone with an activist who had known him in New York, I mentioned the dead twin. Wait, wait, who? She interrupted after a beat. He's dead too? calling the church to request a hospital visit to the deteriorating surviving twin, the response was, he's just looking for attention. They were shocked when I called back to arrange his funeral. The wave was still a distant rumble, and gay men were used to not believing each other. It took a little while before the, wait, wait, who's? began to fall like rain, as slowly the just looking for attentions, dried up. Finally, they called it AIDS. You didn't have time to catch your breath from one wait, wait, before the next who sucked all the air out of you. Now the sick and the previously cynical were all desperately looking for attention from baffled doctors, from shamed family, from a notoriously immovable government. We fought like hell for somebody to pay attention. We fought beside brothers for whom, wait, wait, who? Became, wait, wait, me? We were paying attention, but it started getting hard to count our dead. <clears throat> Good evening, my name is Hank. This is a diary entry from November 29th, 1991. Oh, give me a road where the buffalo roam. Rich is down the hall singing at the top of his lungs as Dan pulls the IV stand to the couch and readies what they call the battery acid. Dan has already hooked the bag to the pole prepped the needle, filled the syringe with saline solution for cleaning the shunt, tapping out the air bubbles like a pro. All 
before Rich comes out to the couch. Fuzzy slipper shuffles scrape the tile floor as Rich makes his way out to the living room. Oh, give me a bow job <laughs> in a truck stop full of men. Uh. It takes a few minutes for Rich to settle onto the couch. There are pillows, a comforter, the remote control, a Sega portable Tetris game, his drink, a teddy bear. In goes the saline. A few drops of the chemo are pointed into the red plastic toxic waste container. It's recapped and set behind the couch again until tomorrow. Kiss me, Rich says. A few moments of silence. Thank you for your kisses. Dan starts the IV. It is so private, this part of their daily life. I feel like an intruder. It seems so ordinary, the way that it's developed into a routine. It scares me. The Santa Barbara sky is clear blue forever today. <coughs> I'm wearing shorts and a tank top. It doesn't seem like the day after Thanksgiving. I, I write a few words and then stare out at the ocean or at the trees that peek up between me and the ocean. A bee tentatively hovers around my feet, propped up on one of the other patio chairs, and inside, the side of me drip, drip, drips. Yesterday came and went like a half-remembered dream between snooze alarms. We did what so many others did. We talked and cooked and ate too much. After we put the turkey in the oven, we drove five blocks to the beach. People played with frisbees, threw sticks in the water for their dogs to fetch, walked along the water's edge looking for shells. Teenage boys in wetsuits ran by with surfboards. And one hunky guy stripped down to his baggy underwear and went in the water. And I said, we had to stay until he came out so that we could see the outline of his dick through his clinging underwear. <laughs> Dan and I sat in our shorts, soaked in the slowly sinking sun. Rich wore pants and a sweatshirt, wrapped himself in a blanket, had the umbrella tilted to keep the wind off of his face. He was cold until the Demerol kicked in. We left a few minutes after that. Otherwise, he would have had to have been carried to the car. Last year, we walked down and spent hours at the beach, ran with their dog, even played frisbee ourselves so much fun. Yesterday, on the way back to the car, Rich took tiny, labored steps and used my shoulder for support. No one said anything. We all pretended like it's normal. Hello, I'm Gordon. The title of my piece is Scott, written in 1990. In December 1988, my lover of 15 years, Scott, started spiraling and wasting as the AIDS virus ravished his body. While I continued to work, my mom would visit him, help with lunch, and massage his feet, a gaping difference from how his intolerant Presbyterian mother dealt with Scott's illness. Mom gave unconditional love to me and Scott. She never asked, why did Scott get AIDS? She didn't bludgeon my fragile sensibilities about Scott's cheating and possibly infecting me. He rallied briefly in January 1989, and we were able to have our annual Academy Award party, where I entertained our friends in drag, singing the lyrics so different from the hell I'm living from the musical Les Miserables. In February, we trekked down to Orange County for opera diva Joan Sutherland in Norman. Fiery and determined, with cane in hand, Scott let Joan's soaring voice bring him solace. The next day, Scott was sitting in the brown strata lounger in our living room, his gaunt, cheeks accentuated his blue eyes. 
Gordon, I think I wet myself. Oh shit, oh no, get up, it's going to ruin the chair. Oh shit, you can buy me a new sh chair after I'm gone. I stopped, kissed him, and tucked away the shame of my selfish, controlling personality. And I told Scott, I, I was thinking that if you were in a hospice, you would get better care. Maybe you'll get better. I wouldn't worry about you when I'm at work. So we didn't have a wheelchair. My friends took Scott's twig legs out of bed and gently placed him on his desk chair. It was like a Jewish wedding where the bride and groom were carried in the air in chairs by the wedding party. At the Chris Brownlee Hospice, the serenity of the architecture contrasted with the zombie-like shuffling of the patients. Gardens of wooded trees kept, crept along the patio. It didn't take courage for me to say, I love you, when I left the hospice. The next day, after my friend Paul visited, his revelations shocked me. Paul said, I read a poem to, that, that I had written because Scott was going blind. He was protecting you. I, I didn't realize I needed to be shielded. 10 days later, I received a call. Scott passed early this morning his heart stopped. When I arrived at the hospice, Scott was lying in his room with cotton pads covering his eyes. I stared at his lifeless form. Iced numbness took over until the lyrics of Touch Me in the Morning by Diana Ross took me back 15 years to when I met Scott and we made it our song. Leave me as you found me, empty like before. After his death, I found a journal where he had written not wanting to live beyond 40. He died March 2nd, 1989, at the age of 39 four months shy of his birthday. The aftermath of his death left me struggling to forgive Scott and myself. Sad. Except for that one. There was that there was that one. Oh, yeah. oh give me a blow job. I knew you'd like that one. I knew it. Yeah, that's a good one. You know what, Sam? What? This next part's gonna be a little sad too. Oh. Well, we're honoring some people who are no longer with us. They contributed so much to society and each of them are radical voices within the arts. You mean like Kanye West? Oh no, he's, he's not actually dead. I mean, his career is, but he's not dead. Yeah, R.I.P. Kanye, or, yeah. or yay, or whatever. Who the fuck cares? That racist piece of poop. I, I agree, Sam, I agree. But I'm going to introduce three fabulous feminists who are going to talk about those who are gone. Robin Podolsky, Dolores DeLuce, and Jim Pentecost. Oh, Dave, those are three of my favorite career wisers. And you know what? They've all had amazing lives. Robin was involved in ACT UP, laying her body down for queer rights during the heights of the AIDS crisis in the 80s. You know, I'm not sure who else she laid her body down for, but you know, she's got to have some secrets. <laughs> she's a lesbian, a rabbi, she's a teacher, a poet. She's got it all going on. Oh, yeah. And Dolores has quite a past, too. You know Divine, right? Well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't everybody? Well, Dolores made her debut 
performing on stage with the gender bending coquettes because of Divine. What? Yeah. And Sam, Dolores is a fabulous mother as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure she had a lot in common with the other PTA moms. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she did. Oh, and then there's Jim Pentecost. He was a big shot on Broadway, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, Patty Lapone could not be here tonight, but we have a more fabulous diva. Jim. Woo! And, and now we'd like to introduce are. Robin, Dolores, and Jim. And Jim. Of all the queer wise members, Joe Levy's writing enriched my life the most. He was the first out and proud gay man I ever knew from the silent generation born between 1928 up until 1945. Interesting times, but not so much for him. <laughs> he had the thirst for knowledge driven by what he thought he missed out on by not being one of the baby boomers like the rest of us queer wisers were in the times we were together. His stories of coming out as a minor in New York City were innocent, exhilarating, dangerous, and sometimes tragic. In his 80s, he had the energy of a teeny bopper, and he used it to do selfless service for Queer Wise. I have a photo of us together in his hospital bed near the end of his life that I cherish. I will always carry his memory in my heart for as long as I'm still ticking. Ariana Morgenstern was someone who would be proud to have been called a social justice warrior, which she was for her entire life. And she was never ashamed to proudly, with dignity, embrace those causes that other people laughed at, from fat liberation to the hom homeless and housing justice to mental health parity. As a writer, she was witty and charming while digging deep and going to the most difficult places. She was a huge personality in the Los Angeles radio scene. She was a longtime host producer of KPFK Radio's Morning Magazine. And she was part of the feminist collective that founded Feminist Magazine, a program which is still going strong. And then there's Jeannie Hutchman. You've heard of Jeannie with her light brown hair? Well, she can't compare to Jeannie with her light brown purple hair. <laughs> She's what I call an original piece of material. She was a baker. I bet you didn't know that. She had her own store called Miss Desserts in Baltimore, Maryland. She was a poet and a writer whose incredible spirit, humor, and loving heart was present in her work. As a member of Queerwise for a number of years, she was a lively and welcome addition to the group. And we were blessed to be able to listen to her unique voice. Oh, and by the way, she brought some really good desserts. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jim, and my piece, I'll call him David, was written in October of 2015. I say that I don't know anyone who died of AIDS, but I'm sure that's not true. Someone I once knew must have died of it. In the 1970s and 1980s, I met many gay actors in the various grad schools where I collected degrees. I must have encountered someone who succumbed. So let me pick one at random then and describe how I knew him. I'll call him David. He was 22, almost six feet tall, trim, with dark brown hair, very clear skin, deep blue eyes, and a dazzling smile. As a gay man on stage back then, David knew how to play the game. He wasn't swishy or obvious. He was a good actor, singer, and dancer who passed as straight. David was a tenor, of course, and usually played the juvenile lead in musicals. I remember him specifically in Once Upon a Mattress, playing the handsome Prince Dauntless. Girls in the audience applauded his numbers enthusiastically and hung around after the performances to meet him. 
we all used to laugh at that and say, if only they knew. <laughs> After grad school, I lost track of him, but I can imagine him beginning to show the signs. Some lesions, a pasty complexion, a loss of weight and energy, not being able to keep up dancing, his voice beginning to waver and lose power, the joy of performing slipping away. Then, confusion and despair, withdrawing from all but a couple of close friends, perhaps a partner, witnessing the end of the career that showed so much promise and should have gone on for many more years. Instead, he lay in a cold hospice bed, feeling the gathering darkness as he gradually forgot everything. But I have an odd hope. I hope that tonight, after the performance, a man in his mid-60s may come up to me and say, I knew David. I was his lover for the last 10 years of his life. He died in 1990, and yes, he died of AIDS. And yes, I'm HIV positive, and for a long time I wondered why I didn't die too. Maybe it was to tell his story. You should know that he achieved much. He was on Broadway a couple of times, only in the chorus, but it was thrilling for him. And he taught dance and voice for many years. He loved to sing, and up to the end, he sang a little. And then this man will take my hand and say, I can assure you he did not succumb to confusion and despair because I wouldn't let him. There was no darkness at the end, only light. Good evening. My name is Wanda Lee Evans. And my piece is AIDS is a white man's disease. It was written in November, 2022. Arrival, Michael Robert Evans, <clears throat> here we are. October 10th, 1958, departure March 16th, 2010. You are the son, brother, lover, colleague, friend, frat, student, one night stand, mentor, mentee, uncle, cousins, and more. You are the black college educated man through Fisk University and University of California, Santa Barbara. Then the financial analyst who contracted HIV in the early 80s and then a crack cocaine addiction. Michael, <clears throat> you were not the perfect angel. I recall there being a point at which you did not share a t in a timely fashion your HIV status with your partner. The thought still gives me chills. Fear is real. You kept climbing out of wells and up mountains and those damn dimples of yours inherited from daddy, whom you knew minimally, promised so much and even up to the end. I did not want you to move from Rancho Cucamonga to Atlanta. You have been going in and out of AIDS related illness for 20 plus years and I attempted to persuade you to remain close by. I knew you were doing a geographic. You were seven years my junior. I moved in with you twice, but it was not really my business. In the meantime, we become mutual spaces of comfort, hope, compassion, reboot. And though running into each other at Jewel's the catch one was auspicious. <laughs> you freaked out. <laughs> A few years later, you were passing out condoms, AIDS literature, and attending 12-step programs downstairs at Jewel's and other black gay bars. I never mentioned to you your earlier comment regarding AIDS being a white man's disease. One can fall, be dropped, Oh, I guiltily remember dropping you as an infant. Can be knocked down and recover from the bruises. Now, Mama and I went with you to Shanti. A few young black men approached us and shared with, especially Mama, 
what they miss from their estranged family relationships. Because living and dying with HIV was often blamed on their already unaccepted homosexual status. We went to meetings at Daniel Freeman Hospital where you were in your third inpatient recovery program from crack addiction. And that was rough. But it taught mama, you and me, about learning how to heal. I learned a lot. At times it was tough for mama to hear how you perceive parts of your reality growing up. But you know what? You continue giving us the opportunity to look in the mirror. Your relationships to cooking, feeding, and entertaining got you through a lot. You were sick as hell again, but determined to meet up in DC. You and Ndale, Margo and me, at President Obama's inauguration. And I remembered the banner you painted and proudly posted on your bedroom wall when you were in high school. It said, Michael Evans for president. Mm -hmm. You always sought out family, whether blood or chosen. And contracting HIV and crack cocaine addiction set you up for finding truth, your truth, and leading some of us to ours. But your life was about so much more. Michael, I love you even deeper as time goes on. So thank you, Wanda, your favorite and only sister. Hi, all. I'm Dolores Deluce, and my piece called Still Alive was written at Queerwise in 2015. Bag hag, bitch, witch, whore, were labels I wore proudly. <laughs> I learned the word fag meant twig, and fags were bo boys used for kindling on the pilings that torched the witches. These fags were murdered merely for loving women who dared to show their power. In my life, fags and hags made one hell of a hot bonfire. <laughs> Back in the day, like a whore in six inch hooker pumps, I climbed the dawn dripped hills of San Francisco. Those pumps took me to the Spanish steps in the noonday sun of Roma, also guided me up in the high tech escalators on misty Hong Kong nights and sparkled like fake diamonds in the hills of Beverly. The last time I wore my hooker pumps to perform a queer wise story at highways, Michael Kearns had the nerve to say, honey, you're walking like a tired old drag queen in those shoes that don't fit her anymore. <laughs> I said, I'm just doing my best for an old queer to age artfully. <laughs> Once I was four foot eleven, a diva. I confess I'm shrinking. I'm four foot eight now. I'm shrinking faster than the Wicked Witch of the West after Dorothy threw water on her. Most days I feel like a house fell on me. There's nothing about being straight that I ever liked. <laughs> it's true. Although the price of aging artfully is steep. It's still a blessing. At least my fate is brighter than Judy Garland's, the poor dear. She never made it to be an old fag hag. <laughs> Between endless trips to free Medicare appointments and lab visits, I get to be the survivor. I get to live the life of a storyteller. I get to watch my grown daughter, Viva, walk in her high heel pumps and shine even brighter than I did back in the day. This boomer refuses to be like the generation of my parents who could not even use the phone answering machine. <laughs> nah, -uh, not me, baby. <laughs> because I'm still here, I get to bitch about the assaults of modern technology 
the robot telemarketers disturbing my two-hour naps. <laughs> or the human with a heavy accent that I finally reach after obeying 20 prompts from the robot. <laughs> I get to revel in the rewards of figuring out my, smart, my smartphone upgrade and then how to pay for my bills online without ever needing to buy a stamp. I'm a woman at the edge of time who has witnessed the loss of way too many loved ones. Although my lost loves will never use Facebook, Instagram, or tweet, or make a TikTok, their lives taught me to value the preciousness of being alive. Now with just four years shy of my 80th birthday, I can hobble proudly in my heels through this high-tech, low-touch world. <laughs> And no matter how dark, bleak, and scary the climate and the wars and the pandemic gets broadcasted on the daily news, as a survivor, I still welcome the future. So bring it on. Call me all your labels for old queer. I'm glad to be alive, and I get to tell the tales of all my many great loves lost to this horrible disease of AIDS. Okay, at this time, we're going to honor three of our very good friends with our Wizards of Words Awards. Rabbi Robin Podolsky. Currently, she's the Los Angeles program manager for At The Well, a Jewish women's wellness organization. She also serves on the board of governors for Sandra Kaplan Community Bet Din, writes at uh, Tribe Herald and the JewishJournal.com, and serves as writing facilitator and script editor for Queerwise. Robin and I have had paths that have crossed over a number of years, <laughs> always intersecting in politics, life, and art. Robin conducts workshops and rituals and study sessions for Jewish holidays and other occasions that combine those kinds of modalities, the study of the text, personal work, small group sharing, and always with writing, with writing, with writing, and with prayer, and with meditation. So Robin, would you come forward, please? <laughs> Robin Podolsky, a wizard of words, for her wizardry in giving voice to the voiceless, and pulling on the ears of the powerful. Amen. There's nothing like being in, first of all, in incredible company with people like Roland and Terry. And there's nothing like being honored by one's respected and beloved peers. Um, I love this community. I love this community of queers and of art makers and of change makers and of people who came through this horrible AIDS epidemic and our recent pandemic still living that ethic of mutual care and surviving. And I'm just so grateful to be one voice among many of you. Our second Wizard of Words recipient is Roland Palencia, who was a valued member of Queerwise, but that is not all he is. He was an LGBTQ activist pioneer who founded a number of queer Latin organizations in the 1980s, including Gay and Lesbian Latinos Unidos and Viva, an arts organization. He is the executive producer of two documentary films, Transvisible, Bambi Salado's Story, and Unidad, Gay and Lesbian Latinos Unidos. 
One of the spoken word events in which Roland participated was titled Sheroes and Heroes. Roland wrote about some of the important people in his life, but these words are also a reflection of his own life. He writes, a shero is someone who does the unimaginable for someone whom they deeply care about. He's talking about his mother, but isn't his Roland too? He writes, a hero is someone who fights for an ideal that transforms the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, the vast majority unknown to them. He's describing his father, but Roland has also been honored as a local hero. Finally, he writes, sheroes and heroes have a vision that transcend them. It is someone who is compassionate, brave, decisive, determined, altruistic, inspirational, and selfless. That is Roland. Please welcome him to the stage. So the Wizard of Words 2022 for his wizardry in forging his words into weapons for the oppressed and being the organizing, quote, clue of GLLU, Gay and Lesbian Latinos Unidos. Jotted down some comments that I, I would like to share. Very brief, Michael. <laughs> 20 minute dissertation. <laughs> um, so, thank you. I'm, I'm deeply grateful and honored to receive this award. Our entire movement is built on the legacy of hundreds of thousands of ancestors, sheroes, and heroes. Many are well known, but most are not. Nevertheless, they were all war wizards, and their fight and struggles deliver us from the abyss of abomination and condemnation towards liberation. When hate is called us sinners and to be burned in hell, we resolve to create a dignified heaven on earth and beyond. When they call us perverts, we became the morality of justice, fairness, and equality. When they call us anti-family, we created our own alternative, extended, and adopted families, while still being the favorite uncle and auntie in our own biological families. We have created a queer family tribe that is of every place and space, language and song, and denomination and coloration. Our adopted and extended families of love can beat their families of hate anytime, anywhere, as they groom their very own young children to be full of bigotry, prejudice, and loving. When haters dance on our tombs as their response to the AIDS crisis, we create institutions of love and care. We create words of resistance, insistence, and persistence. Silence equals death. No one is free until everyone is free. Love is love. Amor is amor. The personal is political. Gay is good. The power of our wars make us alchemists, transforming the base metal of oppression and indignities into the gold of liberation. The nature of our struggle demands that we all become world wizards as we're still under attack. Unfortunately, the terrorist verbal and physical attacks against our communities continue unabashed, especially against our trans siblings of color. Because our words double as our love and peace sign, and also as our most effective weapon, I am beyond delighted to be a recipient of this Wizard of Wars Award on Queer Wise's 10th anniversary and in commemoration of World AIDS Day 2022. I'm deeply grateful. Mil gracias. <laughs> illustrious Terry Wolverton. Yeah. Um, Terry Wolverton is the author of 11 books of poetry, fiction, 
and creative nonfiction, including Embers, a novel and poem, an insurgent muse, Art and Light at the Women's Building, a memoir, which is uh, being filmed right now for a documentary by <laughs> Sherry, who's sitting right behind Terry. Um, Terry has also edited 15 literary compilations. She's received a COLA Fellowship from the City of Los Angeles, a fellowship of uh, poetry from the California Arts Council, and the Judy Gron Award from Publishing Triangle, among her many other honors. Terry is the founder of Writers at Work, a creative writing studio in Los Angeles, and affiliate faculty in the MFA writing program at Antioch University, Los Angeles. And I just want to add that there was a time for years and years I would run into writers all throughout LA telling me about an incredible writing class they were taking. And invariably, they were taking a writing class with Terry Overton. And so many people. So Terry, congratulations. <laughs> This says, for her wizardry in creating space for the LGBTQI plus community's creatives as a mentor, teacher, editor, writer, and earth mother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to uh, first dedicate this award to um, the writer of Guild Quadros mm -hmm. and Michael Niemöller, two of the many incredibly talented artists lost to AIDS. Uh, I want to thank Queer, Queer Wise and, and congratulate you on 10 years. Um, I have so many tendrils of connection here this evening. Um, Sherry Galke and Christine Papalexis, who I uh, knew for many years at the Women's Building, uh, Michael Kearns, yeah, we, we go back. We, go back. <laughs> we were children when we knew each other. Um, Hank and Robin and Roland and uh, Dolores and Joe Levy, uh, you know, it's just, it's uh, like a beautiful homecoming to be here and to receive this honor and tribute. Um, and I have to say that accolades like this are of course lovely, but the real reward is getting to work with creative people as they, in a certain way, at their most uh, open. Mm -hmm. Uh, when they're writing, and um, I, I just, I'm, I always am grateful for the blessing of that work. Thank you. So I'm Jim, and my piece is called Remembering Fritz, which was written in Queer Wise in 2015. Still schlepping, Fritz exclaims as we move a large platform down a narrow hallway to get ready for the afternoon rehearsal. We had met five years earlier when I was the young stage manager of Phyllis Newman's one-person musical, The Mad Woman of Central Park West. Mm -hmm. co-authored and directed by Arthur Lawrence. Fritz and his producing partner, Barry Brown, come at Arthur's behest to see whether they have any interest in producing the show on Broadway. I'm anxious to meet him. Me, 27 years old at the beginning of my career, and Fritz, who had been the stage manager for the legendary Hal Prince on the Broadway productions of Company and Follies. Mad Woman? is just the beginning of our relationship that deepens over the next years. He becomes the big brother I never had with his six foot four frame, dramatic good looks, great hair, and a killer smile. He recognizes in me a kindred spirit who loves the musical theater as much as he does, and a brother 
in whom he can confide and knows that his secrets will be safe. When he leaves the room, his parting line is always, love your hat, see you Thursday. <laughs> Our final production in 1983 was the Broadway musical, La Caja Paul. Fritz once again dons his stage manager's headset. I am his assistant. After the opening in August, I take over the New York production. And for a while, it is the best times. But AIDS is now a presence in the Broadway community. It's only a matter of time before the first high heel will drop. The first is one of our Kajels. And then our genius makeup and hairstylist, Teddy Azar. Today, we forget the speed and the viciousness of the epidemic. After that initial diagnosis, there's a decline followed by rapid and horrifying infections. Fritz gets his diagnosis in the fall of 1986. He tells me he fears that the, if the news gets out, he will not be able to do the very thing he loves the most. Like many others, he's determined to beat it. It all changes in June of 1987. Fritz and Barry are producing a benefit for the Actors Fund to celebrate George Abbott's 100th birthday. Fritz is going to direct. On the day of the benefit, he's running a fever. He's lost weight, and his clothes hang on his lanky frame. He comes backstage before the show. He's wearing light makeup to create the illusion of health. I'm at the stage manager's desk when he puts his hands on my shoulders. The younger brother has stepped into his big brother's shoes. Break a leg, he says. I watch as he slowly crosses the stage. After the show, I see Fritz in the green room accepting congratulations. He still looks terrible, but is so happy that the show is a success. I help him up the stairs to his limo. He's not going to the after party. Before getting into the car, he turns and simply says, thanks, Jim. I give him a hug and help him into the car. He flashes that winning smile and says, love your hat. <laughs> and at the same time, we both say, see you Thursday. We laugh. I close the car door. It's the last time I see him. Hi, I'm still Robin. The piece that I'm about to read was first produced in the collection Blood Whispers, um, edited by Terry Wolferton, published in 1991. Alvaro had the face of an angel. When he stood, his shoulder blades poked out like vestigial wings. We met on the day that I went to Chris Brownlee Hospice as a volunteer. A worker led me through the halls introducing me to residents. The first person I met wanted emphatically to be left alone. The second was happily watching the TV screen that displayed nothing but snow. When we came to the room that Alvaro shared with his lover Juan, he smiled warmly and invited me in. Of the two of us, I might have been the more grateful. Juan and Alvaro were watching Spanish language news Alvaro was ardent about Mexican politics. Juan had immigrated from El Salvador in search of peace and a job. An hour after Alvaro's invitation, we were still laughing and talking. Alvaro was 25 years old, Juan almost 40. They met in Griffith Park where they exchanged phone numbers and Alvaro said nothing happened. <laughs> Alvaro had given up on hearing from Juan when he called and suggested a fishing trip to the Azusa River. When Alvaro moved to the hospice, they had been lovers for over two years. You love me too much, whispered Alvaro one day. When I go in the hospital and they tell me I have HIV, I say, if you want to go, I understand. But he don't leave me. That's how I know how much you love me. He is my baby, mi amante. Once, Alvaro and I were watching a novella on TV. 
he had gone without speaking for so long that I wondered if maybe courtesy was keeping him from saying he preferred to be alone. Then he gave me a look of such depthless sorrow that the world froze. No quiero morir, he told me. No quiero vivir. I don't want to die. I want to live. But he was a young man with all the pieces of the future who would leave nothing here but a tangle of love and loss in the hearts of his lover, his friends, and the mother who would outlive him. I met her and learned where Alvaro got his sculpted features and voluble eyes. He looked at me that afternoon with the defenseless eyes of a child and a young man's determined gaze and the stunned, wide-eyed stare of an old person who sees the shadow coming down. And the only answer I had was to witness his pain, to let it draw my own tears for as long as he needed me to. One day, when Juan had left the room, Alvaro whispered, I'm tired. If there is a drug that make me well, okay. But like this, I'm tired. But I'm afraid. I'm not afraid of my God, but I'm afraid for mi amante. He always told me you have to fight. He loved me too much. Let him love you now as much as he wants, I told him. Later, he will be okay. That was our last conversation. Good evening, one and all. My name is Bill Allen Jr. And the name of the piece that I wrote is called AIDS. Don't need no aid. I wrote it in 1993. Some branches break in the spring, and some break in the fall. So many branches that we wish didn't have to break at all. Those big brown branches that bore oh so much fruit are now fruitless, barren, and oh my God, so poisonous at the root. How did we as gardeners of this world create a tree that would yield no crops, and put the world in a scurrilous peril. And to add insult to injury, we had to point fingers to blame so that near death like cadavers would hide in a corner of shame. The current Charles Drews and Louis Pasteur's and Madame Curie's and Florence Nightingale's too, they haven't come through their promises to me, to us. To you. What would you do if the plague happened to you? Run, lie, or cry? Or would you simply give up to the experts and simply lay down and die? Can't we see that the cure is something that we must pursue if we're to have a life that's become something new. Has profitable pharmaceutical government intervention made you forget that the cure was supposed to be your primary intention? Politics and profits aside, why do you continue to lie while society's children continue to die? And rivers bear the tears of a people's wailing, mournful cries. Who contaminated our blood supply? While bureaucratic agencies continue to prepare their well-rehearsed lies. Ah, then all of you sojourn to Africa and tell us, ah, yes, that's the reason why. Who do you think you're kidding? Do you think that our memories were cut short in the night? Killer viruses made in test tubes. Baby, <laughs> all of your new creations, they're giving me the blues. And did you think that we had forgotten about the Tuskegee syphilis study too? You forgot that you were supposed to cultivate the human soil for continuous life. 
So now what do we do? As we look at all those leafless tree queen, trees, and the culinary gourmet meals that gave us the candlelight dinners for two, that were so mesmerizingly surreal, the political social activists whose voices rose standing on the front lines, risking their lives while being assassinated at will with the hopes that others would have a life full of dignity and freedom still. Masterful tennis strokes that made love match, couture fashions and hats to match, and the latest creations and with a sash in the back. Symphonic R&B and jazz fusion rhapsodies that soothe the savage breast. Hair, perm, coiffed and curled, causing her heads to turn from east to west. Architecture erected for miles long, paintings on canvases, choreographic dances, all in sync with the rhythm of a song. The tree that once bore all of these things now aimlessly stands, a bark with no rings. Winter came early this year, and for others, there was never a fall. So good night to the Arthur Ashes, the Alvin Ailey's, the Michael Peters, the Elizabeth Glasners, the Max Robinsons, the Michael Bennett's, the Ryan Whites, the Amanda Blakes, Mother Hale's babies and mothers-to-be, and all those husbands out to sea, the Anthony's, my Anthony, Thomas, the Lucians, the Donalds, the Dudleys, the Ponchos, too. The world isn't quite through with you. For the world benefited from your gifts and sheer will. And just maybe in the spring, a healthy new tree can be planted still. The lasting gifts of the trees that have gone on is now the sweetness of their fruit. And in our hearts and in our minds, it will live on and on, and on. And uh, our last but not least, I'd like to introduce Corey. <laughs> okay. My name is Corey Roskin. Uh, first of all, we want to thank you for sharing the evening with all of us tonight. We really appreciate you being here. My piece, Healing, was written in November of 2022. I doubted that I would ever completely heal from the bleak years of the plague, from the unending grief, sickness, and death. Does anyone ever heal from a war? Does anyone ever heal from the bright light of friends and loved ones that dims too soon? Does anyone ever heal when their skin and soul are full of cuts and scars? What does healing mean anyway? I doubted that I would ever completely heal from the darkness. The pain and sorrow were buried deep in the marrow of my bones. Ghosts haunted me at night. My river of tears overflowed. I doubted that I would ever completely heal from the nightmare of those sorrow-filled years, the dream that wasn't a dream at all. I doubted that I would ever completely heal. I doubted that I would. I doubted. But even though I doubted, I found healing. Life came back slowly to my numbed heart, even in those terrible years when I cried, howled, raged and screamed out loud into the void, I saw beauty. When I felt depleted and hollow of hope and looking at a future quivering with uncertainty, I saw beauty. I saw art. When there was nothing else, 
There was beauty and art, light piercing through the darkness, art, even in the worst of times, art. Silence equaled death, but art equaled life. Art, in the glories of stories and heart songs on pages, the singers and artists and actors on stages, art, normal hearts, borrowed times, America's angels, works so sublime. Art, Maplethorpe photos and scribbles from Heron, handcrafted, handcrafted quilts made of love and deep caring. Art, the elegance, grace, and depth of Bill T. Jones, moving and dancing from soul, skin, and bones. Art, because the band played on. Art, because there were elegies for raging, for angels, punks, and raging queens, mm. and common threads, and longtime companions, and love, and valor, and compassion. Art, because there were more than 524,600 minutes. <laughs> Art, because then, because now, because here, in this room, today, right now, there are T-cells and sympathy and an endless array of art and magic in words, in memories, in people, and artists, in Michael Kearns, Michael Kearns, Michael Kearns. <laughs> and Robin, Terry, Roland, in my Queer Wise Conference, art, because that's what friends are for. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was amazing. You know, Dave, it's been so much fun being with you again tonight. I know, it's been great. It's been a long time, Sam. Mm. And you know, I think our part of the show is over right now. Huh. But if you want to party with us, we'll be next door. At Pinky's. Yes. Come up and see us sometime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, wait a sec. Yeah. What? We're, we're forgetting something. There's one more part. Oh, Gary Grossman. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, is he naked now? <laughs> Let me see. Uh, I know, it's, it's kind of dark in here like a sex club, so he might be. Yeah. I don't know. Well, Gary's probably wearing his hat. He always wears his hat. Oh, yeah. And nothing else. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Well, sometimes glasses, too. Well, oh, yeah. Anyway, you know what? Ladies and gentlemen, here's Gary! Gary! years. Pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and for us, uh, we kind of gave birth here. Two, uh, eight years ago, we presented the first Queer Wise public performance on the stage. And, uh, but that wasn't the beginning. And um, for me, the beginning here at Skylight was with Michael in 1986. In 1986, right here, we heard for the first time in Los Angeles stories told by people with AIDS. And it affected so much of what we now do at Skylight the powerful stories that came, we, we were intended to do two performances. We ended up doing 18, I believe. And at the end of the 18, we were invited to Sacramento to do it for the, um, the Capitol. And from that moment, the bond that Michael and I had continued to grow and 
10 years, 15 years ago, we turned Skylight into a different model, a model of doing new work, doing plays with powerful stories, and bringing groups like Queerwise here. So I thank you tonight for being here, but the reason that I'm up here is to finally give Michael Kearns the award that we've been trying to give <laughs> for quite some time. Michael's been not only important to Skylight, but a major, major force in Los Angeles. And his activism and his spirit is unending. I mean, I think that uh, my birthday is tomorrow. Michael's is in a month away. We are basically, I am uh, 30 days older than he is. And um, I feel a lot older uh, compared to his moment. He just keeps on going. So without further ado, and not to keep you long here, I am proud to present a Skylight Award to Michael Kern, passionate voice for the voiceless, gifted actor, writer, producer, teacher, tireless advocate for the LGBTQIA plus community, for embodying your fellow artists, for breaking barriers, and for the tremendous contributions to Skylight Theater Company and the American Theater at large. directing a show called Warren, which was a sweet, sweet show about HIV and uh, AIDS. And the cast came to see me in Dream Man. And there was a woman in the cast, and she was older. She was a fabulous actress. And, but she was a little on the dotty side. And that was part of her charm. We, we loved her for that. So she came into the theater, and she, she asked the other actor, she said, where's the net? And they said, what? What are you talking about? And she said, they said he was working without the net. <laughs> <laughs> so from that moment on, I did work without a net here. And I not only worked without a net here, I worked without a net everywhere. And I think that that permission that was given to me to work without a net influenced everything I did. And you know, I realized I didn't have to be a television star or a movie star or any of those things. I would rather work without a net, which I couldn't do in those other areas of life. So. I also have to thank Queerwise, these individuals, and the others who made up Queerwise, there are several in the audience, 
Um, it has been such a later in life lifeline for me to um, nurture, to listen, to hear, to explore the lives of, we started with people over 50, but now we've uh, included younger people, because you see a lot of them up here under 50. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke! <laughs> We do actually have members under 50, and anybody's welcome. No matter what age you are, or what persuasion, what whether you're they, he, she, whatever. Okay, thank you very much. I, I am so appreciative. I'm lucky to have been allowed to express myself and others uh, who are marginalized. Thank you very much. <laughs>